spaceship of friendship taking off. Hello, confidants. My my spoony, my wellness, my chronically pained and ill confidants. Welcome to another episode of Confidently Insecure, the podcast where we are absolutely sure we don't know everything. I am your host, Kelsey Dara, and I am so hype, 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 extra hype to introduce this week's guest. We've not only become friends over recent time, but I was actually a fan of her work prior to us even knowing who each other was personally. And this is a, a chronic pain and illness episode, which I feel like so much of my audience is plagued with. We don't do enough content around it. I'm That's why I'm so excited to have someone that I admire who is going to talk about it. Let me give you her <laughs> stats. Dr. Rachel Zoffness is a pain psychologist, medical consultant, and educator teaching at UCSF and Stanford, specializing in chronic pain and illness. She lectures, excuse me, this is so important. She lectures healthcare profilers around the world on effective pain pain medicine and her workbook here it is the pain management workbook is an inspiration for me and one of my favorite pain books where Dr. Rachel teaches us different methods like CBT mindfulness and other tools that help us change our daily habits thoughts and emotions which can actually change our pain hi Dr. Rachel thanks for joining Thank you for, dude, it was so fun finding you. It's, do you know how rare it is to find someone who lives with chronic pain, but also goes out into the world and talks about it? Like, there's, as you know, there's so much <laughs> stigma around it Yeah. that people, and, and like, it's one of my pet peeves as mm. a healthcare provider that a lot of providers don't talk about their pain. Mm. So there's this divide, like it's like patients over here yep. and providers over here, but like, Big you time. think healthcare providers don't live with pain? Like it's mm. coming for all of us. Yeah. You know? Well, that was going to be my first question to you is like what is your personal connection to getting into this job specialty tell us you were already on a roll yeah sorry sorry you can tell I'm so passionate about it and also I just think you're rad oh so. back at you yeah um so what got me into this so I I've always just been a nerd like <sighs> a nerd and when I was an undergrad <laughs> when I was an undergrad I wanted to live at the intersection of medicine and psychology mm. and neuroscience and and healthcare education and science writing like mm. those were the things I wanted to do and I was like how am I going to do that I have no idea so I like studied science writing for a little while, but I was a neuroscience major. I was brain and behavior. I studied biology and I learned about pain in neuro one, my mm. neuro one class at Brown with Dr. Mark Bear. I will <laughs> never forget wow. it. It was the most fascinating. Yeah. And like, by the by, little, maybe TMI, but like I was a kid who had chronic stomach aches and was poked and prodded and put on a bunch of different medications and told that it was like lactose mm. and I did the elimination diets and a lot of people have been through this. And it turns out, by the by, and we can talk about this as much as you want, it turns out that emotions don't just live in your head. They also come out in your body. Mm-hmm. And one of the one of the number one signs of stress and anxiety in a child happens to be stomach aches, which can include like nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, diarrhea, constipation, bloating, gas, all these things that people love hearing about. Sorry, everybody. Yeah. No, this but, is the podcast where you can absolutely yeah. talk about shitting your pants because yeah. of your so anxiety. Like, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> right. The physical symptoms of anxiety, right? It's real. So so when I finally lear- started learning about pain, it was something I was always scared of. Mm. But what I love about pain is that it does live at the intersection of medicine and neuroscience and psychology and biology and emotions. Mm. Uh, it, it really does. And we can talk about why. But, but so I just went down this rabbit hole. Like I went to grad school and to study more about this brain body connection and mm. then got my PhD in psychology and then. I did my postdoc in pain management in these non-pharmacological treatments for pain, which a lot of people think are floof and pseudoscience. (laughs) And like, if I haven't already made clear, I'm just a nerd, like I'm a science (laughs) nerd and it's not floof and it's not pseudoscience. It's actually really real, Mm. but nobody ever tells us about pain. So now my life is, how do I take this critical information Mm. and spread it to every single person? Because if we don't have chronic pain now, and I don't want to be a pessimist here, Pain is coming for everyone. It just yeah. is. It's part of the human experience. Mm, mm. So to varying degrees, of course, for everyone. But yeah, I mean, yeah, that was my long answer. No, to your short question. no, it was it was beautiful because like you like you said, you 
it's not just a a paycheck, right? Like it's a personal connection and it's something you're actually super passionate about. And I mean, you mentioned it right off the top. There really is this idea of the separation between patient and doctor. And I like the quote that they say, like, if you're actually looking for an expert, ask a patient. And I feel like you kind of check both boxes where maybe you can talk just a little bit about what is that taboo idea between doctor and patient when it comes to chronic pain and why? Dude. Yeah. (laughs) I, I, you know, I, so I've had a couple of other chronic pain episodes in my life and I try, I feel like this work isn't actually about me. Like I know we go into things that we're passionate about because we have a personal connection, but yeah, I've had like chronic leg pain for 10 years because I have a weird Mm. chronic pain condition. Like, but, but the reason chronic pain has been stigmatized is sort of multifold, and I read about it a lot to try and understand it myself. Um, and I know this is going to resonate with you because I've watched all of your shit on pain. Um, <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, because I, well, I think it's really compelling and it's really oh. important that people are disseminating mm. this stuff and talking about it and destigmatizing it, mm. which you're doing. Um, mm. Chronic pain patients in medicine are considered among the hardest patients to treat. Mm-hmm. And I want to say why. Yeah. Um, Chronic pain patient, the as the name implies, a chronic pain patient is someone who's been dealing with pain for a very long time, and so far, nothing has worked. And listen, God bless healthcare providers and physicians. Like mm-hmm. all we want to do is help people who are suffering. Mm-hmm. That's why all of us go into this mm-hmm. field. We want we want to help people. Mm-hmm. Now, what I'm going to say next is controversial, and I get in trouble for it a lot. But guess what? It's the truth, and I am like this balls to the wall New Yorker so I just like say these things that get yeah. me in trouble all the time no we love a no filter I like you yeah yeah we have that in common you're in a safe space here <laughs> I know I know and if your fans like you maybe they won't get mad at me no but, they won't but here's the truth about pain education mm. you're gonna love this 96 percent of medical schools in the United States and in Canada have zero dedicated compulsory pain education that is a statistic from a 2018 survey of all of our med schools. What? And it, and it gets better. Oh, bet. Of, of the med schools that do offer pain education, it is usually purely biomedical. And what I mean by that is it's just anatomy, physiology, and chemistry. Right. And pain is not biomedical. Ever. The experience of pain is this like big word, this biopsychosocial phenomenon, which you know I love about. That we'll probably yeah. talk about it. Yeah. I love it. Which just means like the basic gist is like, yes, genetics, tissue damage, system dysfunction, all very important for pain. And there are all of these psychological factors which have so much stigma around them, mm-hmm. which I know we're going to talk about yeah. that contribute to pain, like cognitions and mm-hmm. thoughts and beliefs and emotions mm-hmm. and coping behaviors mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and also social or sociological factors yeah. that like family and support system and isolation and mm. culture and religion and mm. context and environment and history of trauma. Mm. Trauma Ooh. is so important when it comes to pain. Yep. So. All of these things together create this perfect storm in the middle, which we call pain. Mm. But most physicians, despite their desire to learn about it, haven't been offered Mm -hmm. this pain education in medical school. So, wow. So, wow. Yeah. I mean, you you just said so much there, right? Because I am six, seven years into my chronic pain, uh, like awareness, but I wouldn't say of my journey, right? Like, chronic pain people it's an insanely high statistic of how many people will experience chronic pain in their life and it's defined as a pain that's persisting longer than three months um as opposed to like acute pain which is like you got a boo-boo put a patch on it you're better and you you're so right about like the stigma of attaching the mind to it because and I get in trouble for this and I know I'm going to get in trouble for this because I just did a video with Anthony Padilla about chronic pain where I talked about like listen I'm not saying it's all in your head but it literally is all in your head like everything about consciousness and experience and thought and literally the signaling of pain has to go through your brain in order for it to be processed and experienced. So while I stray away from the idea of it's all in your head, there is so much in your head that we are not 
acknowledging that is connected to pain that literally is in your brain. And can you say that in a way more eloquent way than what I just said? <laughs> yeah. I don't know if you can see me like nodding vigorously. I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. I get so passionate about it. So um, yes, I, I, I'm, I'm going to offer a way of saying that, that like just makes it about neuroscience yeah. because what I find, what I find is that when we talk about like mind and emotions, which I do all the time, cause it's so important when we talk mm-hmm. about pain, we sometimes either lose people or they mm-hmm. think you're saying it's all in your head or your pain is just emotional or it's just stress or depression. Mm-hmm. And like, that is not, hopefully that's not what people are saying. Cause that's not actually correct. Right. So, so I'm going to relocate pain from the body to the brain. So it's very easy to believe that pain lives exclusively in the body. Mm -hmm. Like when your back hurts, Mm -hmm. it's so easy to believe that that pain lives exclusively in your back. Mm -hmm. We all believe that. And we've all been told that. And if you go see a doctor, they will do 762 (laughs) procedures. (laughs) (laughs) But here's what science tells us. Mm. Pain never lives exclusively in your body, in the part that hurts. Mm. Rather, pain is constructed by the brain. Mm. So what the way I like to say it is like, it's not all in your head, but it is in your brain. <laughs> and, and I want to give you evidence for that. Mm. W- one reason we know this is because of this condition called phantom limb pain. Right. And phantom limb pain is when someone loses a limb, like Uh you literally lose an arm or a leg, Uh and you continue to have terrible pain in the missing body part. Mm -hmm. Now, if pain lived exclusively in the body, Mm -hmm. no leg should mean no pain. Mm -hmm. And the fact that you can have terrible leg pain Mm -hmm. in a leg that isn't there anymore Mm -hmm. tells you pretty definitively Mm -hmm. that the pain is not constructed Mm -mm. by your leg or by your back. Mm. It's actually constructed by your brain. And it's Mm -hmm. lots of parts of your brain working together. It's not like there's one single Mm -mm. pain center in your brain. It's like a diffuse neurological process. Also your spinal cord. It's like brain and spinal cord working together. Mm. And of course, body contributes too. So I don't want to be one of those people who's like, you know, it's just the brain or just the spinal cord. There's this two-way traffic between brain and body 100% of the time. Because Mm. guess what? Your brain is connected to your body. 100% 100% of the time. Right. It's not like you can separate out right. your thoughts and your emotions from the physiology of it. Right. Uh, yeah. Did I say that okay? Uh, yeah. I was like, yes, and. Okay. Yeah, I was yes ending the shit out of you over here. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> which it, it brings me to my next question of talking about what we can kind of do with that information, right? Like, Thank God. I mean, thank God phantom limb syndrome existed because I don't know how else we would have maybe discovered. Like we might have just constantly been treating ailments in the place that it hurts. But, you know, they say another good example is like, well, if you don't believe that body and brain could be connected, like what do you call butterflies in your stomach or what do you call like a gut feeling? It's like you feel these things because thoughts are either reinforcing them or are sparking them. Right. So when you mentioned like kids get stomach aches as anxiety in in childhood, I was like, Oh my God, I literally have a whole chapter in my book dedicating to the time I kept shitting my pants at high school at the exact same time every morning. And they thought they were like, it's IBS. It's IBS. It's IBS. Like she needs all these things to shove up her butthole. There's all these problems with her stomach. You got to bring, you got to poop in a bag and bring it to us. And as like a 16 year old, I'm like, this is the worst thing ever. And it wasn't until, yeah, it wasn't until I saw my first psychiatrist at 17 years old that she was like, that's your anxiety talking to your body. That's not your body creating an illness. I was like, all right. So I feel like I luckily got that connection early on in life, but so many people don't because we go to doctors who talk about structural, who talk about physical, who don't ever say. And if they do, it's usually in like a pretty dismissive, like the gross way to say like, you're just stressed out or you need to just have a glass of wine at the end of the day. You need to relax and breathe. Like, you know, one of my best friends is going through, um, uh, pelvic floor therapy. And what, one of the first doctors she saw a gynecologist was like, you just need to have wine before you have sex. And she's like, that's not fucking helpful. That's like not the helpful way to, 
to say that the brain is connected to your body, right? It's it becomes no, so no. It also mi- is missing that there's something profound happening for her. her exactly, bo- there's something happening there, and yes. wine is not the effing answer to that problem. <laughs> exactly. So <laughs> I, I, I want to talk a little about a bit more about how we can help people understand that brain body connection and how it can actually change because what uh one of the workbook methods that you teach is on changing the pain and I think the first thing to understand is is that changing is possible period so can you explain it in your fancy sciencey way (laughs) totally I love that you know all these things so um I want to ask can we do a quick aside like a two minute aside on the stomach stuff let's do it I'm going to tell you some I want to tell you some stuff that's going to blow your effing mind. I can't wait. It took wait. me a long time to figure this out. But but what I want to say about pain changing is we now have established that pain is constructed by the brain. What we know about the brain is that the brain is always changing. There's a word for it. It's called neuroplasticity. It's like one of my favorite words. Yes. And what it means is the pathways in your brain are like the muscles in your body. The more you use them, the bigger and stronger they get. And the less you use them, they atrophy, just like your biceps, right? If you're like, if you said to me, Zofnis, I want huge biceps, I'd be like, great, Kels, go to the gym, lift lots of weights, or stay at home, lift lots of weights, whatever we're doing these <laughs> yes. days. And, and your biceps will get big and strong. And conversely, if you stop lifting weights for a couple of months, you notice atrophy. The same with the pathways in the brain. Mm-hmm. So if the brain can change, mm-hmm. pain can change. Mm-hmm. If the brain can change, pain can change. Period. End of sentence. Mm-hmm. Because the brain is plastic, which means it's always changing. Mm-hmm. And that includes what I'm calling the pain pathways in your brain. They're always changing. And we know that because if you ask anyone with chronic pain, Their experience changes from day to day, Mm -hmm. from year to year, from Mm -hmm. situation to situation. So there's always like this pain recipe for amplifying pain. Mm. And there's always this pain recipe for dialing down pain. Mm. But I want to do this quick aside on the stomach before I forget. Yes. Because I think you're going to like it. I do. I already do. So, yeah. (laughs) So I went to like a bazillion GI doctors and stomach doctors. And everyone had a different theory about what was going on with me when I was a kid and again I you know the diet stuff Mm -hmm. and the elimination stuff and the IBS or all the things okay you've heard of serotonin before Mm -hmm. of course you have (laughs) will you tell everyone what serotonin is it's the feel-good chemical in your brain serotonin exactly is a neurotransmitter that regulates a lot of things like sleep and appetite and also mood Mm. so when people go on ssris selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors those are our most common antidepressants Mm -hmm. and sometimes also they're prescribed for anxiety and other so they're they're it's well known that serotonin is a mood regulator Mm -hmm. now guess which part of your body has the most serotonin. I'm going to play like I don't know. I'm going to play like I don't know. It's got to be your brain, right? (laughs) You've heard this already. Right. So your gut, your gut has 90% of your body's serotonin. Wow. Your gut has 90% of your body's serotonin. And there's this bundle of neurons they've discovered. And this is like a known thing. And I don't know why every GI doctor and psychologist isn't talking about this. But there's this bundle of neurons that connects your brain to your gut. And it's called your enteric nervous system. It's Mm -hmm. a known thing. There's like this great Harvard article called, I think it's called your second brain or something. Mm -hmm. They Mm -hmm. call it your second brain and it's your, you know, and it connects your brain and your gut. It's exactly what you said before. It's why you have butterflies in your stomach. It's why you have a gut instinct. Mm -hmm. It's why watching the news can make you sick to your stomach, Mm -hmm. right? It's the reason people get the runs or vomit before they give a talk Mm. or a presentation that makes them nervous. So, so it's normal. It is normal and natural to have GI stuff Mm -hmm. during periods of stress and anxiety. Like it doesn't mean you're crazy. It doesn't mean you're mentally ill. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean you have some serious medical diagnosis. And I want to be careful to say, yes, of course, things can go wrong with your GI system. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course, there can be like bad things happening in Mm -hmm. your stomach and every place in between. Mm -hmm. And yes, of course, parts of the body, including the back, Mm -hmm. can go wonky and Mm -hmm. require surgery and all the things. So Mm -hmm. I don't want to suggest that those things aren't real. They are absolutely 100%. But but pain, the experience we call pain, is constructed 
in the brain. So I just wanted to go down that little rabbit hole and say that because I think most people don't, I didn't know that for like 150 no. years. This was like a recent, there's a document. The only reason why I know about this is there's a documentary called, I think the the second brain. And it actually talks about how it's technically the first brain because it was the first thing that was developed. Like when we were literally just like mitochondria cells is that the stomach, the digestive system was actually developed before a human brain. So it's technically the first brain that was then labeled the second brain. And we uh, no what I'm going to do a whole episode about eventually about how the serotonin in your stomach is also related to your diet because duh but we don't we I don't have to take you down that long winding road um okay thank you for that also and the clarification so the confidants know I love a workbook obviously because I also wrote one and uh, especially one about pain. As you know, that's the whole format of my next book. I've got this like as my second Bible. So why did you find it important to make this something that people could personalize to their experience? Okay. Seems so, obvious. Um, <laughs> yeah. And I, and, and this will also hopefully target your initial, your question before I went off, took us down that tangent no. rabbit hole. Yeah. So in Western medicine, there's this divide between physical pain, which lives over here. And if you have physical pain, you see a physician. Or in Western medicine, you have emotional pain and you see a therapist. Mm -hmm. Now, that is not how pain works. Pain mm -hmm. is both physical and emotional 100% of the time. And I'm going to prove it to you. But we do all of us, me and you and everybody else on the planet, a disservice when we treat people with pain as if they're just a body part and we'd send them down this divided rabbit hole and pretend that the things are disconnected. Like, oh, you have anxiety and depression? Let's go over here and mm -hmm. talk about that. Oh, you also have chronic pain? Let's go over here and send you the physicians. Mm -hmm. Well, you'll, you'll get a bunch of prescriptions. Mm -hmm. Like, that actually isn't how pain works. So mm. what I mentioned before is that pain is constructed by a bunch of different parts of your central nervous system, mm -hmm. like your spinal cord and all these parts of your brain. But there's three parts of the brain in particular that construct the experience we call pain. Mm. There's your prefrontal cortex, mm -hmm. and that's the part of your brain responsible for like executive functioning and what you're focusing on, like what mm -hmm. you're paying attention to. Mm -hmm. There's your... Uh, Cerebral cortex, which is the part of your brain responsible for thoughts, mm -hmm. a lot of things, but also thoughts, and your limbic system. Mm -hmm. Your limbic system, which I know you know, is your brain's emotion center. Yes. It's your brain's emotion center. Mm -hmm. So I just want to wrap this up in a neat little bow. Mm -hmm. What that means is all of the sensory messages from your body, from your back, from your knee, from your jaw, filter through... They go up your spinal cord. They filter through your limbic system, your emotion center, before they become the experience that we call pain. And what that means is that pain is both physical and emotional 100% of the time. Mm. Neuroscience tells us that's true. Mm. And by the way, we have known this for forever. Like the 1960s, Melzack and Wall, the gate control theory of pain. Like mm. this is not new information, mm. but we still... In modern medicine, because healthcare is actually profit driven and big pharma has their fingers mm -hmm. in everyone's pie, mm -hmm. which sounds perverted, but it's not. No. Nope. Yeah. So so medicine still treats pain with pills and procedures, even right. though it's twenty twenty two. And we have known since the sixties that pain is physical and emotional and that you need right. to treat someone with chronic pain like a whole person right. and not just a body part. If you're right. not treating trauma, if you're not treating depression, if you're not treating panic and if you're not treating anxiety, you're not treating pain. Ooh, girl. Say it louder you for can the tell, people like, in the back. <laughs> yeah, louder for the people in the back. And so so the other thing that really frustrates me is that what I do as I'm a pain psychologist, which no one has ever heard of, and everyone always says, well, oh, oh, you're a pain psychologist? Do you treat physical pain or emotional pain? And now I just nod my head uh -huh. and I say, yes. yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But when the fact that that's the number one question tells me that like no one has ever, no one has ever had their pain explained to them. Mm -hmm. And how unfair is that? Yeah. So... So, so um, medicine doesn't reimburse a lot of treatments for pain that are not pills and procedures, as you Correct. probably have already discovered. Yes. 
So it doesn't matter what you call the therapy. There's all these therapies out there right now Mm -hmm. that are essentially what I'm going to call cognitive behavioral therapy, but it doesn't matter the name you put on it. Sure. These therapies target cognitive processes, things happening in your head. Mm -hmm. They target behavioral choices and lifestyle choices like nutrition and sleep and, you know, all the like movement and, you know, and social behavior. Um, so there's all these treatments out there that exist that are, uh, not pills and not procedures, but they're not reimbursed by insurance. Mm. So because of that, I took everything that I do in my practice and I stuck it in a book. Mm -hmm. That's actually why I wrote the pain management workbook Mm. because it felt very unfair to me that only rich people could afford Mm. this thing that I offer Mm. because insurance just doesn't reimburse it. Like that doesn't, that's not okay with me. Right. So I just put it all in a book so that it's accessible and affordable to everybody. That's actually why the book was born. We love that. We love to make it an affordable, accessible queen. And I truly do recommend it because you you find a way of breaking it down in a way that doesn't feel so hard to understand. Like you use a lot of examples and metaphors that like make people like me who didn't go to study fancy brain science school to understand. And, and I want to circle back to something you said where, you know, we, it's not just us that isn't taught how the pain is connected that way, but also the doctors aren't relaying that information to us. Right. Like, and if it is, it's like I mentioned, usually done in not so great of a way as someone who is teaching healthcare providers on how to have a pain management repertoire in their, you know, in their practice, how do we teach doctors to talk to patients about the emotional side of pain without minimizing? Because I know for sure if I went to a big fancy doctor and the first thing that they said was like, well, how's your stress levels? I'd be like, that's not the fucking point. And even I understand the medical science behind it. So how do we find that balance between like my pain is being taken care of physically and I'm being talked to about the mental aspect of it without wanting to, you know, blow my brains out. <laughs> or punch someone in the head. Yes. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> danger to self. Yeah. Danger to others. Exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's really tough because, um, and I, you know, I struggled, honestly, like I struggle to talk about this because my physician colleagues are like some of my closest, dearest people and intention is always really pure mm. and, and pain education doesn't happen in most med schools, 96% mm. of them, Crazy. you know, and, and so I struggle to talk about it cause I don't want to place blame anywhere. Like I think our education system is honestly just broken, but, mm. but I'm going to give you a metaphor. So now I teach med school. Uh. I teach physicians at Stanford. I teach physicians at UCSF and I teach physicians at Dartmouth because I'm so, I want to change pain medicine. I mm-hmm. want to, and I don't know where to start sometimes. Sometimes mm. I'm like, do I reach out to people like Kelsey and just like spread it to the masses <laughs> yes. and just like let everyone know? Yes. But do I go and like approach every med school and offer to just teach for free, mm. which by the way I do. I'm oh, like, wow. how do I change pain medicine? I'm just, I'm over it. Yeah. I'm over it. So I'm going to give everybody a metaphor. And this is the metaphor that I give physicians to teach to their patients. It's like a four minute metaphor. And it really explains the connection in a way that I think, and you're going to tell me, Mm. but it really explains the connection in a way that I think gets rid of the stigma Mm. around this, like this mind, brain, body, Mm. emotion, physical overlap. Okay. Okay. So I want you to imagine in your central nervous system, Mm -hmm. (laughs) use your imagery (laughs) skills that you have like, um, a pain dial and it Uh operates much like the volume knob on your car stereo. Like Mm -hmm. you turn pain volume up. And you can turn pain volume down. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of things that change pain volume. Mm -hmm. And most of us know a lot of the things that change pain volume. So Mm -hmm. I'm going to just say three things in particular out of a menu of a million Mm -hmm. that change pain volume. One is stress and anxiety changes Mm -hmm. pain volume. And I'm going to explain why. Two is mood and emotions change pain volume. And three is attention or what we're focusing on. Mm -hmm. And here's how this works. When stress and anxiety are high and your body and your muscles are tense and tight, which is what happens during periods of stress, whether we want it to or not, and our brain is thinking anxious and stressed out thoughts, your brain sends a message to your pain dial, amplifying pain Mm -hmm. volume. Mm -hmm. 
So when stress and anxiety are high, Mm -hmm. your brain is turning up pain volume. So pain physically feels worse Mm -hmm. when you're stressed or anxious. Thing Mm -hmm. two is mood and emotions. (laughs) So what we know from neuroscience is when our emotions are negative and our mood is low, and by negative emotions I mean um, misery and depression and frustration and anger and rage and all these things that actually ironically happen when we have chronic pain. Mm-hmm. Your limbic system, that thing we were talking about before, your yeah. brain's emotion center, sends a message to your pain dial, amplifying pain volume. Mm-hmm. So pain feels worse when emotions are negative. Mm-hmm. Thing three is attention. So when we are stuck at home, stuck in bed, thinking about and focusing on our pain, mm-hmm. our prefrontal cortex mm-hmm. sends a message to your pain dial, amplifying pain volume. Mm-hmm. When we are thinking about pain and focusing on it, pain physically feels worse. Mm -hmm. Now I know that's true for me. Like Mm -hmm. when I talk about my leg pain, I feel Mm -hmm. my leg pain amplify. Like that's right. But now here's why this is good news for you and me and everyone else in the world living with pain, because the opposite is also true. Mm. The opposite is also true. So when stress and anxiety are low, which by the way, we can hack Mm -hmm. as we all know, and we can Mm -hmm. lower our own, but when stress and anxiety are low and our body is relaxed and our muscles are calm and our thoughts are calm, Mm -hmm. our brain lowers pain volume. Mm. Pain feels less bad Mm -hmm. when stress and anxiety are low. Mm -hmm. Thing two is mood and emotion. Mm -hmm. When emotions are positive, we're happy, we're grateful, we are with people we love. This podcast episode is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Relationships take work, babes, especially the most important one you can have in your life. Your relationship with yourself. A lot of us will drop anything to go help someone we care about. We'll go out of our way to treat other people well. But how often are we giving ourselves the same treatment? Okay, you know me. I love to do my morning yoga. And the most important part of my self-care routine is staying and keeping up with therapy. So this month, BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you that you matter just as much as everyone else does. And therapy is a great way to make sure you show up for yourself. I absolutely love my therapist on BetterHelp. She's taught me so many things that I didn't realize you could like do through digital online therapy. Like we get very physical in our practice. We get very heart centered into our bodies. She's taught me this amazing, cool, crazy thing called tremoring. I'm just absolutely obsessed with her. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Give it a try and see why over 2 million people have used BetterHelp online therapy. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and confidently insecure listeners get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp dot com slash c i that's b e t t e r h e l p dot com slash c i we're feeling good we're we're engaged in pleasurable activities the limbic system lowers pain volume yeah. pain feels less bad when emotions are positive. By yeah. the way, this is not like some sort of magic panacea. It's not like, oh, I'm in a good mood, so my pain is gone. It's yeah. not that. Sure. So all we're talking about is adjusting pain volume. So, and thing three is attention. So when we are mm-hmm. out in the world, engaged in activities that give us pleasure that we like, or we're just really distracted, mm-hmm. your prefrontal cortex lowers your pain dial. Mm-hmm. So like everyone can tell me about a time when they were so absorbed in some activity, they briefly forgot about their pain. Yeah. And that is not right. And that's not like magic. No. That is your brain's pain dial. Wow. So, so what I like about this metaphor is that uh-huh. it connects the thoughts and the emotions and the behaviors in a way that it's like just effing neuroscience. It's right. just neuroscience. That's really <laughs> literally is the neuroscience of pain. That's right. it. Right. And that is something that Four minutes in a doctor's appointment to explain that metaphor will cost you like $250. And the ability to just slap on like a fentanyl patch or prescribe you a nerve, like gabapentin is a lot easier and faster and they don't have to really like answer your questions. And I I just, I'm literally trying to imagine any of my like old dinosaur white male doctors with their glasses and their bald heads trying to break that down for me. Sorry, not sorry. And like, there's just never a world in which they would have done that. And I'm not being like, you're a woman, so you care more but also a little bit like you're young, you're a woman, 
your doctor who like gives a shit about this thing and not making money and that I think comes through in the in the care you take to explain and like makes me feel empowered right because I'm going oh yeah oh yeah Uh uh-huh I can relate to that here's where and I got to this part with with um I'm also I I read like 17 books at once I'm never just like on one book I know I love that about you <laughs> I'm, it's so awesome I'm also yeah. reading The Way Out um which talks about like again I my brain wants to affirm this feeling of pain because I can go, well, I have these structural problems. I've had multiple surgeries. I have titanium in my face. There is no reason why I should not have pain because this is a foreign body in my body. (laughs) There's a foreign object in my body and this will be this way forever. And I've read about, you know, people getting to a point where they where they have surgeries and pins and and screws and things all in their body and their pain is completely gone. And so I'm working on right now getting over the well something structurally wrong with me and I I'm I'm trying to get out of that thought pattern and I'm struggling. Yep. And I think yes. I have friends that you know they have like a colostomy bag or you know my buddy's in a wheelchair or you know, whatever that uh, I have a limp or like my leg is missing, like, you know, whatever it is, how do we yes. wrap the, the, the times that it's not a mysterious illness or a mysterious pain that just showed up in our back or our gut? How do we, how do we teach ourselves to get around that roadblock? That was a long question. It is so, <laughs> it is so, it is so hard. And what you're talking about is like this critically important cognitive component about pain. So we said before that pain is this like biopsychosocial phenomenon, which means, yes, mm-hmm. of course, there's biological components. Right. And there's these like psych components, which is thoughts, emotions, beliefs about your body and beliefs about pain, which are often the hardest to change and coping behaviors mm. and like lifestyle changes. And then mm. there's this social or sociological bubble. And you're talking about the cognitive component of pain, which is really hard. Mm. Have you heard of, the, I feel like you've done so so much research. Have you heard of a guy named Lorimer Mosley? No. You're going to love him. <gasps> I so, can't wait. So what you're so what you're talking about like all these books that you're talking about are all the same in that they're relying on this fund of information that's been out there for a long time. So the concept you're talking about is Lorimer Mosley, M O S E L E Y. I happen to love him. He edited the intro chapter for my book and he didn't even charge me a cent. I know he's amazing. He's this famous physiotherapist out of Australia. He did a Ted talk on pain that you will love. I'll send it to you after this is over. And he's written a bunch of books on pain that are very expensive, but also very wonderful. Um, And he talks about this, that it's normal and natural to have like biomedical beliefs about Mm -hmm. pain. By that, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's structural. Mm -hmm. Like people say to me all the time, no, but my pain is organic. Mm. My pain is due to Mm -hmm. some, like exactly what you're saying, something Mm -hmm. structural. Like there's this foreign body in my body Mm -hmm. and that's the cause of my pain. Mm -hmm. And it's just so hard to, to just like do this thing to ourselves where we're like, yes. And that's the bio part and that's Mm -hmm. real. Mm -hmm. And and mm-hmm. if we're only focusing on the bio domain of pain, we're missing two thirds of the pain problem because mm. it's bio, psych, Psycho. social, Psycho. right? And you're not, I mean, like I already know from reading your stuff and listening to your stuff that you are targeting all the things. Mm. So it's mm-hmm. not like, mm. mm-hmm. but you're right. The belief about that mm-hmm. is really hard to shake. So yeah. um, Dr. Mosley really goes down this rabbit hole of explaining in, in a really great way, like a lot of my stuff and a lot of you know, Alan Gordon stuff yeah. is actually Lorimer Mosley stuff. Huh. And you'll, you'll really love his stuff. It's, yeah. And basically what he talks about is so pain is the body's danger detection system. And it exists to tell you that there's something wrong. But what happens when we have chronic pain is that the danger detection system gets really wonky mm-hmm. and it gets really sensitive mm. over time. And when that happens, our brain is now responding to little bits of sensory information from the body, mm. but it's amplifying them and mm. exaggerating them and telling us that there's an emergency mm-hmm. when there's actually not an emergency. Mm. And it, and, and it's hard to distinguish that because if, if, pain, if we're biologically wired yeah. to believe that pain means danger and yeah. damage, yeah. 
it's very right. hard to to undo that. Right. But there's lots of ways of doing it. Um, I Go know on. That that was sort of a winding. <laughs> no. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm so like, I let's get t- into some. Of, say more about yeah. That? Let's like get into some of the methods, right? Uh, yeah. Rad. Okay. So t- can I first say why pain becomes chronic? Because I yes. feel like that's very confusing. Please. Okay. You can do anything you yeah. want. I would follow you into the dark. I'm like, uh-huh, this is Dude, yours it's now. just so funny. Like, I feel like you and I could talk for 17 oh, hours. And yeah. We, yeah, and I also could learn so much from you. Like, oh. I know that there's books you've read that I'm going to be like, oh, my God, should I read that? Oh, my God. Yeah. I've got a stack behind me. But I love it. I, I get into, like, the weirder, witchier shit. So we'll, we'll, I love it. we'll cross-reference after. <laughs> I'm all about like whatever works. Yeah. You know what I mean? Same. Like, I, I always say. the thing that works. Yeah. My yeah. like number one quote yeah. is if you told me to stand on my head and sing the ABCs backwards, I'd do it. And I don't give a shit if it works totally. because the placebo effect is very real. And I don't think that's oh, a bad girl. thing. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. yeah. Like whatever works, work it. That's yeah. like my MO. Yeah. Just work it. That's also the um, AA's memo. It works if you work it. <laughs> oh, is that right? <laughs> yeah. Keep, keep coming I knew back. I had heard it works it, but... if you work it. Yeah. That's so funny. I knew I had heard it, but I didn't know where. There you go. I love it. Okay, good. I mean, I'm all about it. Yeah. So so the funny thing about pain, we, mm. we've established some fundamental things now, right? Yeah. Like we know that pain lives in the brain. We know that it's changeable. Mm-hmm. We know that you can change pain volume and that there's a lot of things that do it. There's bio things that change pain volume. Mm-hmm. There's psych things. There's sociological things. All these things change pain volume. Um, however... The reason pain becomes chronic mm-hmm. is goes back to this thing where the pathways in your brain are like the muscles in your body. The, the more you use them, mm-hmm. the bigger and stronger they get. So again, if you said that you wanted like really strong legs, I'd be mm-hmm. like, cool, let's go do lots of leg exercises. And over time, your leg muscles will bulk up and they'll get bigger and stronger with use and with time. Mm-hmm. The pathways in the brain are the same. So I want to give you an example of this. Will you tell me a skill that you were bad at and you practiced it over time and you got good at it and darts. skill Doesn't playing matter. darts what playing darts, darts. <laughs> great are you yeah. good at it now I'm really good at darts yeah <laughs> I believe I believe you I kind of like want to watch you play darts yeah now. come I over you. we'll, we'll hang and play darts in the backyard rad great <laughs> great so so I'm gonna say this back to you what happened over time with darts was with practice Mm -hmm. and experience Mm -hmm. the dart pathway in your brain got big and strong Mm because a lot of things happen when you play darts believe it or not Mm -hmm. there's like this visual spatial thing happening you have to know how much pressure how hard Mm -hmm. to hold it how hard to throw it how far away to stand where to Mm -hmm. put your body all all of the things are important when it comes to darts so over time the dart pathway in your brain got big and strong and my example is like piano I don't play anymore but Mm -hmm. I played when I was a kid And I would play, everyone who's ever played an instrument knows this. You practice enough times and you sit down at the instrument. Mm -hmm. You don't even have to look at the music. Your fingers Mm -hmm. just know what to do. And it's like this weird, eerie magic. You're Mm -hmm. like, shit. And even now, sometimes I'll sit down and like, my fingers will know what to do. And I'm like, oh my God, it's been like 20 years. Mm -hmm. How do you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's because the piano pathway in my brain Mm -hmm. with time and experience got big and strong. Now. Mm -hmm. Guess what happens to your brain when you inadvertently, accidentally practice pain for weeks and months and years? The pain pathway in your brain gets really big and strong. Right. And when that happens, we say that your brain, Dr. Kelsey, has gotten sensitive to pain. Mm. Yes. And specifically what I mean by that, like when I think about the word sensitive, I always think about how to explain that. So like dogs and you have like a menagerie. Of, I want to ask you what's happening in your life. Like I watch your stories. The, and I'm like, how many the dogs? Foster, we've got a foster bulldog sitting under yeah. my legs right now as we speak. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he brings so me a lot so, of distraction from my pain and a lot of account. You know, we could go down that road. <laughs> fuzz therapy is real and I'm all about it. I love that. I am all about fuzz therapy but dogs have a sensitive sense of smell so like in this room right now your dog is picking up on scents that you cannot detect Mm -hmm. and it's the same with a brain that has become sensitive Mm -hmm. to pain what's happening now is that your brain is scanning your internal environment looking for anything that might be dangerous is that danger is that danger is that and any bit of small small bits of sensory information 
create in your brain this amplified output because God bless your brain. It is trying to protect you. Mm -hmm. And that's what it thinks it's doing by creating pain. Because again, pain is your body's warning system. It's just Mm -hmm. trying to protect you. Mm -hmm. But like every system in the human body, the Mm -hmm. pain system can fail. Mm -hmm. So when we have chronic pain, which we know is its own disease process, Mm -hmm. what is happening oftentimes, not always, is that there's this amplification process happening and small bits of sensory input are being interpreted as dangerous when in fact there's not danger. Mm. Did I say that? Did that make sense? Yeah, 100%. And even even when, even, mm, how do I ask this? Because again, like I'm struggling with this part of going, I'm pretty fucking happy for someone who experienced a lot of pain. I meditate. I do yoga. I eat well, minus I've my sugar, severe sugar addiction. But like, uh, and this was actually one of my questions that I had was like, uh, la, 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 where did it go? Um, about goal setting and like keeping your life moving despite pain being what feels like an overwhelming part of life or ability to do things. And that's where I think people look up to me and also probably criticize me with going like, there's no way you could be in pain all the time because you're traveling and you're living and you're smiling. And I'm like, no, no, no. That's like, that's how I'm able to stay positive and and living and alive. And headphones cause me a ton of pain. And I find it ironic that I have fallen into a you know, career path that involves talking in my face and wearing headphones. And so with goal setting, I like get stuck of like, you know, I can't wear AirPods, anything. It's just sensitive to anything that's around my face, even down to like brushing my teeth and scarves. So it's like, I'm not going to be able to change certain parts of my life. And there are times where I'm just like, I've got pain right now and I'm doing a thing I love and I'm dealing with it. Love it. Love it. And it hurts. <laughs> and yeah. so the, yeah. the, the, the finding of, of, I guess I don't even know what, what I'm like trying to find, but it's like, I know that there's not going to be necessarily a pill. I know that I can't always like take a break to be mindful and like do breathing, but like, yeah, no, totally. Where do we, where do we go when I feel like I I'm pretty like positive, I'm pretty healthy and happy and I still experience pain to a degree that is interruptive in my life. Right. (laughs) That was a complex little locket for you. (laughs) No. um, You're asking sort of like the core question for Mm. people living with pain is like um, what I admire I've said this to you before, but what I admire about you is there's a lot of people with chronic pain who legitimately struggle to function. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent here because I have to. Um, People with chronic pain frequently, understandably and normally develop anxiety and depression Mm -hmm. secondary to their chronic pain. Mm -hmm. Because as we all know, Chronic pain is a thief. Mm -hmm. It steals your ability to work sometimes. It steals your ability to play. It steals your ability to go on vacation. It steals your ability to exercise and effing wear headphones and (laughs) engage in your life in the way that you want to. Mm -hmm. And, And because of that, a lot of people normally and naturally with chronic pain develop anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. And one of my, like, one of my, like, I don't know what to call it. Like the things, one of the things I'm just like so passionate about writing, which I think is so Mm. wrong, is this idea that chronic pain patients are also mentally ill. And Mm -hmm. that's, you asked earlier, like chronic pain is stigmatized in part because people think there's a lot of mental illness around chronic pain. Mm. And what I want to say is as someone who treats chronic pain every day, Mm. I watch my patients get out of bed and get back to life. And guess what happens to their anxiety and depression? It's got it. As their pain yeah. goes down yeah. and they're able to function more, their anxiety and depression magically effing goes away. Mm. I am not a miracle worker. <laughs> I, I am doing a thing I was trained to do. Mm. And what I want to make sure everyone knows if they have chronic pain mm. is that anxiety and depression are what we call normal responses to an abnormal situation that is not in my very humble opinion Uh. appropriately named 
mental illness. Right. It's a normal response to an abnormal situation. It's situational depression. It's situational anxiety. Mm-hmm. And when the situation, which is not a character on the Jersey Shore, <laughs> which is chronic pain, goes down, the, the symptoms that you're experiencing of low mood and fear and anxiety about your body and your life also go down too. Now, mm-hmm. this is not to say that you can't have some sort of mental illness prior to developing mm-hmm. chronic pain. And I am clearly not saying that mental illness is not real. Like mm-hmm. I am a psychologist, hello. <laughs> but I do want to make sure, hello, yeah. but I do want to make sure to say that stigmatizing people with chronic pain and saying that everyone who has chronic pain is mentally ill is just like not no. okay. Yeah. That's like not okay. Right. Um, can you remind me what you asked me? I'm so sorry. <laughs> I just, like, went down that rabbit no, no. You, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I agree because like uh, I know people who I genuinely <laughs> do not think will get better because they've made their entire career about their chronic pain and illness. And if they yeah. make their YouTube content, their tweets, their Instagram, like they're following Ooh. their ev- everything is about. Oh, whoa. And I, and I sound like an asshole and I sound controversial for saying that, but like, I truly believe as long as some people are reliant on their pain for let's say income or content or validation from strangers right like finding community it becomes their biopsychosocial experience then that's where they're going to live forever and it's shitty but it's I think true that doesn't mean that I'm not someone who also clearly dabbles in chronic pain content and like spends offline all of my time trying to figure out how to escape it yeah. Bringing it back to the question I asked was, you know, I do feel like I am someone who lives a pretty healthy, yeah, happy oh, yeah. lifestyle. And, you know, yeah. I have anxiety and depression and yes. I'm medicated and yeah. I still have pain. So, like, where, yeah. what do we do? Like, it, it, theoretically, yeah. you would think <laughs> it, it, in the model of uh, not bio, but psychosocial, if I was the happiest, most well rounded person of all time, I wouldn't have chronic pain at all. But is there, is it the bio part of me that's not allowing me to get rid, I'm making air quotes, rid of chronic pain? (laughs) It's just so funny. Like when I'm hearing you talk, I'm like, I am like, I think you are too. I'm just like innately a helper and Mm -hmm. I want to help and like heal everyone. And the answer is you are my friend. You're not my patient. If you were my patient, you and I would go down a deep rabbit hole of all the things that might be maintaining your pain. And, Mm. and I don't know what those are, but there's probably, it's not, I promise you, it's not just the bio. There's Mm. definitely a bunch of things happening because that it's true with everyone. Mm. There's always a bunch of things happening. And by the way, if you've ever had trauma, here's what trauma does. Trauma sensitizes the brain to pain. This is like a known thing. Yeah. Like rates of chronic pain in the veteran population are much higher than in the civilian population because veterans experience such significant, but the amount, it's like the comorbidity or the co-occurrence between trauma and chronic pain is something like 50% up to 80%. I mean, so, so if you've had trauma, your brain is extra sensitive to pain messages because pain messages are your body's danger system. So if you've been traumatized, your brain is like, oh, is something bad happening? And how do I protect this human? Mm. So trauma sensitizes the brain to pain too. So Mm. there's like, there's, it's a complex pain recipe all Mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. Um, But, but to to the thing you were saying before is you are doing a bang up job (laughs) and you know this already of like living your life anyway. Uh. And as you said before, if you weren't, if you were a Mm -hmm. person, and this has happened to a lot of people, including me, if you're a person who stops living your life because of the pain and you stay home and you stay inside and you stop exercising and you stop getting sunlight and you stop seeing your friends and you stop moving your body Mm -hmm. and you just sort of subsist on like potato chips and ice cream to (laughs) self-soothe, you are effed. Yeah. Because that is what creates a life of misery and suffering and chronic Mm -hmm. pain. And what you're doing is you are living your effing life even though you have Mm -hmm. pain Mm -hmm. and you're doing your damnedest to knock Mm -hmm. it out and, and kudos to you. But, but, (laughs) What you just, what you just highlighted very beautifully Mm -hmm. is like, there is a recipe for maintaining a life of chronic pain and suffering and misery Mm -hmm. well beyond where you are right now. Like where you Mm -hmm. are right now is night and day different than where you would be Mm -hmm. if you were stuck in a dark room Mm -hmm. alone with your pain every day. Yeah, 100%. You would not be, you would not be okay. Yeah, no. And there's a lot of people with chronic pain 
yeah. who are not okay. Yeah. And so, and so what you and I are trying to do is help people change their recipe so they can yeah. be more okay. So you asked, what do we do? Yeah. So, so let's, let's do that. Yeah. So, um, right. So there's a lot of ways to change pain with this biopsychosocial recipe. Um, and, and let me say what I mean by that. Uh, do you, can I, can I ask, and if this is too awkward, just no, tell me. It doesn't exist um, in my world. Awkwardness. Never had it. <laughs> Great. Don't know her. Do you happen to know your recipe for high pain? Like a bad pain day? Yes. It's. Uh, like, will you say it? I'm actually going to write it while you say oh it. Oh my gosh. Yes. Um, yeah. It is probably podcasting more than I should. So I'll like stack up three podcasts in a day instead of one. Yep. Just um, while you're talking. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> definitely. Like if I'm not doing my morning routine, which is so vital, which is like my yoga meditation, breath work stuff. So if I just stay in my bed and on my phone, um, and definitely talking about it and noticing it. And if it does bloop up as like a, like, you know, my lightning strike happens, if yeah. I let my brain go into being too critical of it rather than curious about it like even sometimes curiosity about it will spiral me into it the more I'm thinking about it the more it's happening and the more I'm aware of it so that's like my dial up for sure yep um does sleep affect your pain or not really when I got it's different for everybody yeah when I got sober and started sleeping well I wouldn't say I wouldn't say I notice it more or less (laughs) Great. Okay. Uh, nutrition out of curiosity. Inflammatory foods, sugar. Definitely. Um, what about like movement? Oh yeah. If I'm over, over talking or under talking. (laughs) Okay. Perfect. Um, what about like mood stuff? Does that ever impact pain? Uh, yeah. Like if I'm crying too, especially like the more I'm in my feels in my face or like laughing too much even. So if I'm too joyful and smiling, I'll feel it more. Or if I'm like sobbing, I'll feel it more. (laughs) Rad. Um, (laughs) do you know if like during, if you want me to stop, tell me. No, I'm, I'm here. During periods of like panic or past depression, do you notice pain more or not really? I'll say during panic attacks, I'm not aware of my pain because I'm literally (laughs) focusing on panicking. (laughs) All the other symptoms. But yeah, like depression, 100,000%. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, so I the reason I just did this fun activity with you, it's called a pain recipe activity, and the reason I came up with it is because it's really hard to explain to someone, mm-hmm. well, what are all the things that we can do to change pain? So I just want to say, this is in the workbook also. This is not, yes. we're not going to knock it out. I filled but it out. <laughs> you did? I of love course. that. Okay, so here's my, here's my way of explaining it. Ready? So yes. just as there's a, what do you have a, do you like to bake? I am not. I am not a things. baker. <laughs> Great. Me either. So I'll just say, just as there's like a recipe for chocolate chip cookies, and there are people out there who know what that is, but it involves like mixing together certain ingredients in certain amounts and then like putting it in the oven at a certain temperature for a certain amount of time. And there's like a list of ingredients for that. And if you F it up, you're going to have really gross cookies, right? (laughs) And so just as there's a recipe for cookies, there's a recipe for high pain and there's a recipe for low pain. And in any given day, we can put together our ingredients in a way that gives us some agency and control Mm -hmm. over our pain recipe. Mm -hmm. And it's always a biopsychosocial pain recipe. Mm. Always. So I just want to go down the recipe you just gave me. So most people know their high pain recipe. Mm -hmm. The question is, what is their low pain recipe? Right. And that is harder. So Kelsey's high pain recipe is working too much Mm -hmm. and I'm going to put that in the social bubble Mm -hmm. the social bubble is like work and school and all these environmental contextual factors not having a routine Mm -hmm. a routine this is not important a routine is like a behavior so Mm -hmm. I'm going to put that in the psych bubble so Mm -hmm. routines are coping behaviors having a routine by the way is great for a brain with chronic pain because brains love homeostasis or balance so routine is phenomenal so no routine working too much, 
not doing yoga, Mm -hmm. which is physical movement for my body, which also calms my brain and my Mm -hmm. stress system. And by the way, full disclosure, I don't like yoga. I want to love it. I should Uh, be someone who like talks about it all the time. And I don't. I have a whole chapter in my book about how I became a fucking stereotype of myself of a white girl living in Los Angeles and I'm furious <laughs> about it I'm furious I hated yoga for 20 something years of my life so I completely understand and now okay, well, I can't live maybe, without it I love that and maybe one day you can teach me but okay so so too too much work no routine routine is disrupted which by the way happened to everyone during the pandemic not for mm-hmm. nothing mm-hmm. not doing yoga not meditating so not calming my body and my mm-hmm. my pain system mm-hmm. staying in bed which mm-hmm. is a behavior and of course we know actually from research that that does actually amplify pain mm-hmm. being on screens too much screen time mm-hmm is also a known ingredient in a Mm. high pain recipe. Mm. Paying attention to pain or focusing on pain, we know that engages the prefrontal cortex Mm -hmm. and it turns up pain volume. Critical thoughts, the Mm. cognitive component of pain, like criticizing myself for experiencing Mm -hmm. pain, criticizing myself for not doing the right things. Cognitive components of pain. Sugar, that's part of our bio. Mm. Nutrition, our diet changes our body, changes our pain. Um, Over or under... Exercising, I think you said movement. Uh, over, over too, laughing too or movement. under under movement. Yeah, uh, like yeah, too right. much oh, joy or too much sadness. <laughs> That's right, right. And then we said crying and sadness mm-hmm. and depression also will amplify pain. And of course, we know that emotions change pain too. Mm-hmm. So I would say that's a pretty good example of a high pain recipe. Mm-hmm. And then the question for us is, on a day to day basis. What are the things we need to do Mm -hmm. to make every day a low pain recipe? And that's not easy to do because like you said, you are hardworking, busy ass (laughs) queen bee. Thank you. And some days you are going to be working too much and you're not going to have time for yoga or, Mm -hmm. and hopefully we can protect that for ourselves Mm -hmm. because we need to, but it's not always realistic. Right. But so anyway, the general gist is creating a high pain recipe gives us the power to create a low pain recipe. And then we need to somehow figure out a way to enact that every single day. Mm. I love I love that you also said like it's not easy because I try to imagine myself as like married with kids and more animals. And I'm just like, it's no wonder so many of us don't have the luxury to feel better because we don't have the time or the prioritization of it or the knowledge to even say like, hey, I have to put myself first in order you know the classic I gotta put my own mask on before I can put on yours or whatever airplane you got it it. um I can't believe we've already been talking for an hour and change because sorry no this (laughs) is I I haven't even noticed it because I I think we need to do a part two because I'm not done with my questions and I'm yeah I I feel like this is a good place to stop in terms of like We've learned Agree. what pain is. We've learned that it can change. And we've gotten like a little nugget into the way of changing it. And I I want to I want to have more conversations. So if you're willing, would you be down to come back and do a part two? Yeah, totally. Yeah. OK. Well, in the meantime, where could the confidants find you and more of your work? Oh, right. Well, so the pain management workbook is on Amazon. Um, <laughs> there it is. And it's also, if pe- people have been emailing me, they're like, I hate Amazon. I don't want to support Amazon. Yeah. So my publisher, New Harbinger, they also have it on their website. It's just the pain management workbook, and you can get it on New Harbinger's website, too, if you don't want to support Amazon, which I support. I feel because that. that guy. Yeah. Don't even want to talk about that guy. I feel that. Um, Yeah. And also, you know, it's funny. I was never a social media person until the pandemic happened. Like I sort of like casually made an account and I was like, I'm not going to do this stupid thing. (laughs) And then the pandemic hit and I was like, I'm not going to any of my conferences. Where are all of my people? Like, where's the content? Like, how do I read all the papers and how do I find my colleagues? Because I am like a social animal. I need people. So, so I created a Twitter account. I'm um, at Dr. Zafnis on Twitter and I do a lot of pain education. It's like, and a lot of mental health advocacy and a lot of this, like, how does the brain connect to the body stuff? Cause I think it's so important. Yes. And I want to be just like you, just like a loud voice in the dark. I want to be like you. Dark. Good. Some mutual admiration. Yes. Club. It's just like a dark world out there. And then 
I'm on Instagram. Also, I'm at the real docs off. It took me a year and a half to figure out how to work Instagram. What? Like, yeah, I figured out stories like four months ago. I'm not kidding. Oh I just like gosh. couldn't. I should have called you. you I didn't know you four me. months ago. Yeah, fair. We're new friends. I'll allow I just like it. didn't understand it. And now I need to um, get you thank on God TikTok. For Instagram. And now we got to get you on TikTok. Ugh. Dude, let's not ah. put the cart before the horse. Okay, But fine. like just to Something say, I found you on Instagram. So thank God for Instagram. Yeah, fair enough. Okay. And vice yep. versa, right? Like I found you in a physical brick and mortar bookstore. Like we're, what are we <gasps> living in the resident? The, I you read didn't tell me that. Yes, I found you in Barnes & Noble at the Grove. Stop like, it. Like last year. I think I got it right when it came out because I was in the the like wellness section and I grabbed a couple books and this was one. And I remember being like, how have I not done this yet? And it was, I think it's because it had just come out. I think I got it right oh when it came God. out. Oh my God, in Barnes and Noble, that like warms my heart. Like the Thanks. idea of this like nerd, this nerdy book that I wrote, like showing up in a bookstore that you were in is just like blowing my mind. I and then before I that. forget, I have a really nerdy website. It's just my last name. It's Zafnis.com. And for people who want to learn more about pain, there's a free resources section and Ooh. I've been putting it together for a decade. Amazing. There's like yeah, there's like medical journal articles and a list of my favorite books and like the best podcasts about pain I need to put. Obviously, I need to put this one on there too. Ah. Um, I haven't updated it in like five months. No, this is I just great. don't have time. I don't blame you. Yeah, and and wait, what else? Oh, there's guided audio for pain. Like, Ooh. and I there's a lot of them that I hate, but there's some that I really like. Okay. Um, Anyway, there's like more stuff than you've ever, ever wanted to I read in your life. I definitely am going to put that down below in the description so all the confidants can check it out. All those links will be below. And stay tuned for part two because we're not done. This isn't over. Uh, so stay tuned, confidants, and we will see you next week. Ta-ta! Woo! Woo-woo!